Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, PEP organizers, Ruben, to invite me and for everything that make possible to be to me, for me to be here today. So today I'm going to talk about ensemble techniques for high performance machine learning. It's this is a, a topic that I like very much. It's a topic that helping me to be here today uh, and a topic that Kaggle helping me a lot in my career. So first of all, I would like to talk something about me. So I'm from Curitiba in Paraná. I'm graduating in electrical engineer, more specifically in telecommunications and electronics. I had a, I have a master's in electrical engineer also in 2008, and I have a, a vast experience uh, as an engineer. First, working for Siemens, developing high-end uh, telecommunication circuit boards. Then I worked for Petrobras as an automation engineer for many years. Later, in Petrobras, I switched to a data science and. Last year, beginning of last, last year, I joined Airbnb. Uh, it, and it was a great experience for me in San Francisco. I learned a lot. Um, part of what I'm going to share here today is do Airbnb and my previous Kaggle experience. And this week, after the, this conference, I'm going to join Oppo as a startup in the Silicon Valley, um, very related with machine learning and AI techniques. Uh, also, right now I'm in second in Kaggle uh, world ranking. I was number one for more than two and a half years. Um, some of my ho hobbies include machine learning. I do for hobby also, of course. Electronics, video games, and movies. So last month I, 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 I had a talk in Poland. And I shown that that uh, figure there about stacking models and people. Uh, every time people see that figure, people start to think, "What is it? How can it be possible? This is too much complex for me. Uh, I will never learn it." And people do that kind of face here when see some stacking assembler, some complex modeling. But what I'm trying to to, to talk here today, it's, that's not so complex. It's something that is reasonable, understandable, and everybody can make use of stacking to improve model performance. So the basic, what is ensemble of models? What, or why, or what is the, the definition? Well, uh, ensemble combines the strength of each classifier to make a super learning. This is, I think this is the best uh, definition of ensemble for me. But I got a real example from a book, The Wisdom of Crowd, a book. For, uh, and in that book, there's a paragraph that say that to that story that in 1906, uh, the great statistician Francis Galton ob observed a competition to guess the weight of an ox and a counterfeit. So 800 people joined that competition, and he discovered that the average guess of all competitors was extremely close to the actual weight of the ox. So nobody hit exactly the, the weight of the ox, but when that statistician took the average of all competition, competitors' guess, he found that it's very, very close to the actual weight of the animal. So this is one of the proofs that ensemble works. Uh, and there are many ways to ensemble. There are many algorithms. Uh, this is, I listing some of the algorithms available. Uh, I could talk uh, one entire day about every one of these algorithms, but there is one specific one that I won't talk today. And this one is stacking. Stacking is a very powerful algorithm to improve the 
precision, the performance of the model. And it's very well proven in Kaggle competitions that it can improve a lot. Because I start to use uh, stacking after my second competition in Kaggle. And since I start to use stacking, I got many, many top solutions in more, more than uh, 50 competitions. So by definition, stack generalization uh, by the author of the paper from 1992, stack genera generalization is a generic term referring to any scheme for feeding information from one set of generalizers to another before forming the final guess. Uh, this is the idea. The idea is to build models to guess, to predict uh, the target, and use that guesses, that predictions, as an input to another model. That is the main idea of stacking. From Wikipedia, we can see ver something very similar. Ensemble methods that use multiple learning algorithms to obtain better predicted performance than could be obtained from any of the constituent learning algorithms alone. Yeah. So it's a combination of algorithms or combination of predictions. Uh, the basic idea is very simple. Sometimes it looks uh, complex, but the idea is do some data set. We can have many versions of the data set. Are you going to train many level one models here? That models can be any kind of model. And then for each model, are you going to stack side by side the predictions of the models and train a second level model using that predictions to get the final prediction? This is the main idea. It looks very reasonable. Uh, at least very simple to me. There's not so, so complex theory here. But, of course, we can make it complex. Uh, <clears throat> but usually, from my experience, simple stacking architectures can perform very well, very, very well. So what defines stacking winning performance? <laughs> Yeah, this is a very good question. People always ask me, why stack, stacking works? Or why stacking performs so well in, in, in competitions? And I could talk one entire day about stacking and, and why it, but I try to find a single word that defines very well why stacking works so well. And I think that word, and I try to put here in the presentation. And the first time I, I talked about that word that defined stacking was a month ago. And actually, most of the people here probably knows what I'm talking about. But some people get surprised when I say what the word is. Uh, the word is diversity. What makes a stacking very, very good and very well performing is differ difference between models, is diversity, difference between solutions. If you, if you get a lot of similar solutions and try to combine the predictions, the final result will be very similar to the, to the predictions because they are very similar. So when you have diversity, one model is specialized in predict some kind of behavior, and another model specializes in predict another kind of behavior. When you combine both, the, the algorithm that combine both picks only the best predictions of each case, of each model, and discard the wrong ones or the, the, the worst ones, right? So that's why we try to explore when try to improve the performance of the models. So how diversity? There, I listed five topics that we can uh, work to try to improve diversity and improve the performance at the same time. The first one is data set, feature engineering. Basically, it can be data cleaning, uh, feature uh, 
preparation, uh, a lot of feature engineering, um, feature for, uh, formatting the feature for different training algorithms. So data preparation is part to increase the diversity. Training algorithm is the second way to improve the diversity. You can have one data set and you can train many modules using exactly the same data set. You can train a linear model, uh, a nonlinear decision tree, a neural network. So the learning algorithm is part of getting diversity. Uh, approach. I, I use it here, team members, the term team members, because people tend to think different. So when you combine models, also how each each person in the team build the model, how, the, how the each, each person thinks uh, the best way to build the model can improve diversity. I can build a completely solution, a very good solution, thinking in my way, and anyone in, on that room can build another solution using your own way, another way to build the solution. It's very likely if I, I calculate the correlation between my solution and everyone in this room solution, the correlation will be low. It means correlation low, it means high diversity. They are different. If the correlation of my predictions and your predictions are one, it means they are exactly the same. It's, there's no information gain combining that predictions. Another way to improve the performance is target transformation. It works especially for regression problems. So sometimes we need to transform the target, apply some uh, monotonic function, some can be linear function to the target. For example, predicting values, values you can uh, observe some very high values compared with small values in the labels. Usually applying a log transformation on that labels can improve your model performance. And of course, after the predictions, you need to apply the inverse of the transformation. And by the last, stacking architectures. Uh, there's an infinite way to build this uh, stacking for models. So changing the architecture usually uh, improves a, a model. Uh, and it's very correlated with the problem you are trying to solve. There is no uh, generic way to do the stacking architecture. You need to find it out for each problem you are working. So feature engineering. What about features? This is the, the first step to improve diversity. So you need to take care with all kind of features you have in the data set. First of all, of all cleaning the data, then treating correctly categorical features, and then numerical features. What I mean? cleaning the data. You can, for example, drop out layers, clip features and labels, uh, drop features, classify numeric and categorical features. Some data sets, you, you have no idea if the feature is numerical or categorical. You need to apply some tests uh, to, 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 find out, to find it out. Uh, sorry. Subsample and oversample also the data set, in the data set. For categorical features, there are many ways to improve diversity. Uh, for example, you can one-hot encoding, uh, like build a binary matrix for all the categories. You can frequency encoding, ordinal encoding. You can build embeddings from the categorical. Uh, this is target encoding. This, is, this works very well when the categorical features have high cardinality. And this is a technique uh, very, very good also and provides very good diversity if combined with another techniques. Uh, target encoding is when you use the label to encode the category. Uh, dimensional reduction and combine two or more categorical features in only one and so on. Actually. I, I, I use uh, etc. here because there are infinite ways to, to, to treat, to, to format or transform the, all the features, right? This is only the, the ones I use more. Numerical features, uh, missing 
value, values imputation, bucketing, clustering, monotonic transformation for linear models, linear combinations of any features, evolutionary algorithms to try to think combinations between features. There are a lot of ways to improve numerical features. Text and images. For text, the, the, the basic steps to, to add diversity, you, it can be a combination of any one of these techniques here, like cleaning test, steaming, liming, removing stop words, normalizing, translating, TF, IDF, transformation, bag of words, embeddings, it can be trained or pre-trained embeddings, and so on. There are infinite ways to treat also this kind of features. For images, uh, one technique very well use it for add diversity is augmentation, augmentation uh, extract features in pre-trained CNNs, uh, build stat statistical features based on the color channels of the image, uh, maybe s some uh, open, uh, some image processing features also. It's infinite possibilities. Okay, the second way to improve diversity is training algorithms. As I told, you can use infinite training algorithms in your, in your stacking. The most ones used are gradient boosting decision trees, neural networks, uh, even deep learning, support vector machines, decision tree algorithms, any kind of decision trees, factorization machines, uh, linear regressions, logistic regressions, uh, navy base, nearest neighbor, regularized grid forest, WOPA Webit. So you can think an infinite number of algorithms to train your, using your data set. Each one of these algorithms listed here, you, you work different. You, try, you, 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 predict, you build a different prediction of your, using exactly the same data set. And what I'm, we are talking here is about improving the performance. And the best way is to combine different predictions from different models. So if each one of these models build different predictions, the best way to improve the overall performance is combine all these predictions. Approach, thin up, as I told before, uh, every person thinks differently. So combine different solutions, add diversity, and improve the results. Target transformation, I, I told also it's apply uh, a monotonic function on the target, especially used for regression. For example here, if you apply a logarithmic function on your labels, on your target variable, after the predictions, you need to apply the inverse of that transformation, of course. And this, I, I listed only two formulas here, but you can think any formula you, you think is better to approach your problem. Uh, usually, a logarithm is one very well used, uh, especially if uh, for regressions, because it, it tends to uh, to decrease very high values to make it small numbers. Uh, at the same time, the second approach is the inverse. It 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 makes small numbers very high, and um, when combined, the, the um, uh, Exactly the same model, but train it using that two different target encodings here. When you blend the solution and stack the solution, you get some improvement. Because any, any one of these models are exploring a different part of your labels. For multi-class problems, it's possible also to do that uh, target uh, transformation. For example, combine two or more classes in only one and training a model on that new class. So for stacking, it doesn't matter uh, what's going to be the input. Imp the input on, of the second level learn can be anything. can be the original features of your data set, can be the predictions of the models trained on the first level. Uh, even if you are building a classification uh, solution, a solution for a classification, you can build a regression on the first level models and then input the regression predictions on the second level of the stacking architecture, even if it's a classification. So 
any kind of target transformation is fine to add diversity. Stacking architectures, this is the, the fifth way to improve the performance. This is a very, very simple stack uh, scheme here when I build two different versions of the same data set. And for example, I use the data set one to train three models, a logistic regression, a neural network, and SVM. Then I use data set two to train two models, gradient boosting, and an extra three model. And then at level two, I took all those predictions and I combined using just a very simple weighted average and got the final results, right? This is a very simple way to do a stacking. When I combine these this five models side by side here and do a simple weighted average to improve the results. If you want to make it more complex, uh, you can, for example, add one more model here at level one and three models at level two and do the same weighted average combined at level three. This kind of stacking here is a stacking that in Kaggle usually leads you to a top 10% or even top 1% solution if you, did, you made it very well. So this is, is, I'm not generalizing it, I'm not saying that this is, with using this stack is going to be the best performance of all the time for your data set. This is a very good way to explore linear uh, characteristics of your data set and nonlinear characteristics of your data set, right? And also using that uh, nonlinear and, and linear uh, models on the second level, level also uh, is another way to explore very well the, the feature difference and information from the, from the predictions. For my experience, increasing the number of le levels here, for example, four, five, and so on, then leads to better performance because usually here at the second level, you are very close to this, the data set limits. So adding more levels usually leads only to overfitting and not to increase of performance. Okay, uh, but how to, to build each model predictions? Usually, it's a very simple process, just using out of fold predictions, a simple cross-validation strategy. There's nothing fancy in it. It's pretty, pretty standard. So for each model here at level one, run it in a cross-validation way, right? So training on folds and predicting in an out of fold or holdout set. And then build that predictions here concatenating out of folds predictions. It's a very standard procedure. Uh, this is some user information uh, to do the initial steps for the stacking is to define the number of folds to be used. Uh, this is very important because it needs to be done in the beginning of the stacking process. And ah, one thing and I want to serve this for time series approach. People usually made the mistake to random split uh, the folds, but in time series problems, you need to split by time. This is something also very standard, but usually people made that mistakes and do it like a shuffle, uh, 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 simple uh, random folds on time series. Okay, another very uh, important uh, information here is for stacking, you need to predefine the fold indexes. For example, uh, from, my, from my experience, using, usually using five folds enough to get the, the highest performance of your model. Uh, but the, the fold index must be exactly the same for all the algorithms, all the models you are training on all the levels of your stacking. Why needs to be the same? To avoid uh, interfold 
information leakage when you train the second or above levels in the stack. Uh, also, using exactly the same folds in all the models make it possible to compare the performance of the models. This is very important because they are building different models using different algorithms, different data sets. So you need to, f to fix the, the, the index, the folds, for all the models to be able to compare the performance of the models. And this is a stacking workflow. Usually works very well for any kind of model. It's very simple. Uh, but I'd like to tell you guys. So first of all, I define the fold index and I use it for all the models. Then I prepare the data set, uh, fit a model using any folds defined, compute out of fold performance, and do the stacking. If the performance is better than previous, keep the new model and try to find a new one. If the, the performance of the new stacking is not good enough, just drop the new model. And back to that step here. So prepare a new data set, fit a new model on the stacking, compute out for the performance, test the final performance, uh, and compare with the previous one, right? If the performance improves, keep the new model and continue that looping process, like adding new models to the stacking only if it improves the overall performance. Okay, so to improving feed, uh, stacking performance, there's some tips uh, and tricks. One is feature engineering, never give up. Usually, most part of the information you can extract from the data set is using feature engineering, combining features, trying to find some relations between the features. There's infinite way to do feature engineering, and uh, there are some solutions, the most commercial solutions that tries to find some feature combinations or feature engineering to automatically. But actually, in my uh, opinion, feature engineering is some is similar to an art. Uh, it, it's, it is very, it depends on how uh, you look to the problem. Uh, it, you, it, it is a step of the process that needs intelligence to be done, right? It's not a, a, a brute force attack. So doing the right feature engineering is, is like an art. So another way is to fine-tune fine tune level one models. So to, imp to improve the final performance of the stacking, the level one models must be very well tuned. Bagging, uh, averaging, averaging multiple runs, subsample, subsampling the data set every, at every run is another way to improve the performance of the, of the overall performance, especially if the algorithms that you're going to run are stochastic and depends of some initial condition. Uh, I've seen this kind of technique improves a little the performance of the final stacking. And keep track of the preview results and offline experiments. This is very important to keep track of it, like have a, a parallel log of all your experiments and describe what you, you made on the past and what the performance achieved on the past. So you know, like adding a new feature, a new model, or something new to the final solution, it's improving and why it's improving the performance. Okay, number six here. Keep track of how much time your models takes to run. Uh, it can be a strategic decision to train our models, and this is very important. Uh, I have I had uh, some real case when, for ex example, it took two days to train a model, but I don't have two days to deliver to deploy a model. So what what to do in that case? Uh, uh, especially if you don't have time to train a model. So it's very important to keep track uh, of the runtime of the models and use it 
for compute new models on the stacking, for example, if you know that your module takes one day to run using 1,000 trees, maybe you can find a, a good balance in between performance and runtime, and you can decrease by 10 times the runtime of the module, just decreasing the number of trees in your algorithm, right? And also it depends on how much compu compu computing power you have available. Uh, if you have like a huge clusters, maybe runtime is not a problem, or, or prediction runtime is not a problem. Uh, number seven, don't tune too much level two and above models. At level two, you have very, uh, uh, very good, very strong predictions at level one. So if you try to tune too much the level two, it leads to overfeeding. Keep track of the stacking final performance. So if you know what your stack performance is, you know if adding a new module would improve the performance or not. Good press and Kaggle tips. This is more related to competitions, but define the indexes uh, of the uh, cross-validation and share with all the team members in a text format. Usually it's a good uh, practice because different team members can be using different language to compute the, the solution, right? So if you save the, the cross-validation indexes in a specific format for Python, for example, people in R cannot, cannot load the, the index. And if you start to train models with different indexes and then start to stacking and blend everything, you can, it can lead to overfitting. Uh, the same for the predictions, try to, to save to write in, in, in a text format to make it inter-language uh, possible. Some uh, definitions how to save the model, and like member name, model name, version, if it's a train, train set or test set. This is very good practice for competitions. Uh, Another way, uh, another very uh, important information from competitions, uh, if you have a stacking and your cross-validation score improves your, your actual score by 1%, you should expect the same amount of improvement on the public leaderboard. So if you have an offline evaluation improving 1%, the online must improve around 1% also. If it, is not, if it doesn't hold, holds true, it's because something went wrong in your model. Uh, always calculate the correlation between all stacked models for train like plus the text set. Uh, if models are very correlated, like 0.99 and higher, you should consider dropping one or averaging both models. If you have any stacking of, for example, 10 models, and two of these models are 99% correlated, maybe you should drop one of those models because they are very correlated. There's no much information gain from adding these two models in your data set. Maybe just average the predictions or drop one is a good idea. Why? Because local correlation means high diversity, and diversity is the key to improve performance. Uh, check for anomaly in both train and test set. Uh, this is not only for Kaggle, but in a real world problem. Uh, I call it anomaly mat matrix when I calculate the correlation between all the predictions on the test set and I subtract from the same correlation matrix of the, te of the test set. So we must expect the correlation between these models are exactly the same in the train and the test if everything is okay. Uh, the anomaly matrix should return something close to zero. If it's not close to zero, it's because something went wrong in your model, uh, and maybe your test set predictions are not good. It's, some, it's something like a health check also, sanity check, yeah. But it's very useful in a real world applications also. Uh, another way to sanity check the solutions, the predictions, is to calculate some statistics uh, and compare with the previous results. Also, this is a very good uh, trick. 
don't spend much time and try to build the best single top 10 model. Instead, build 10 different top 100 models and stack it, it all. So it's possible to build a single model with the perfect feature engineering, perfect uh, training algorithms that leads to a very high performance. But you take all your life trying to get that model. It's very, very hard, it's very comput computational intensive. You need to test all the possibilities. So it takes a long time. Better than that is to train 10 different models using 10 different feature transformations, using 10 different training algorithms, and stack all predictions. You get it a high performance model in much less time. OK, this is a use case. Uh, a Kaggle competition from Otto uh, Group is a product classification. And this image is an original image. I, I draw in paint. When I won that competition and I post in the forum, what I, I, what I did, what I, I made to win that competition. So this is a multi-class, nine-class classification problem. And to solve that, that problem, uh, we train it. 33 level 1 models and 3 level 2 models, and then combine it using a weighted average approach. This is the, the idea of what it, we made here on that competition. For the level 1, we trained 33 models, including a, a variety of uh, training algorithms. We add some raw features here at level 1 also. We combine all those features and models here in a new matrix, and we run an Xgboost, uh, a neural network, and an uh, Adaboost with extra trees here at level two to get new predictions, and just combine it using a mix of geometric and, and weighted average, arithmetic, geometric and arithmetic weighted average, right? So our local five-fold cross-validation score, it's a logarithm loss, is around 0.39, six. And the leaderboard, the final score on that competition was a little different, but it was 38 too. But we observed that improvements on the, our local validation reflects the same improvement in the leaderboard uh, score validation. So this is very important. Well, so the advantages of stacking, there are some uh, very, very easy to observe advantages. Uh, it, doing stacking, you can compute the performance of different models of all individual models in your stacking. You, can, you know exactly the performance of each one, and you know what model performs better with your data set. Uh, it makes possible to build and add new models interactively or uh, it means incremental teamwork. You can start to building models, saving to disk, and every new day you build a new model, and your team member also building new models. You can add it interactively in an incremental way to the stacking, and every day comparing the new performance. This is very good. You, you, you can work step by step. Uh, also doing st stacking, you can compute the overall performance of the stack in the final performance. So you know uh, uh, approximately what your stacking is going to perform with, you, with your metric you choose. You can achieve very high performance using the technique. This is the basic idea. It's very great for Kaggle. Why is great for Kaggle? Because Kaggle have uh, fixed data sets, right? The competitions, you fix the data set, the data set's not going to change, so you can apply any kind of algorithms to improve the performance, and you have two months to do that. So that's great for Kaggle, but maybe it's not great for companies. Why not? Because data changes every day. Uh, from my experience from Airbnb, uh, we have data sets, huge data sets, and every day arrives like uh, an, another huge data set. 
So the data is always, it's the dynamics, right? It's always increasing. So how you can run a stacking every day and how can you maintain like a lot of models in your, in your pipeline, in your in production every day. So for companies, it's a bit complicated. Doing stacking is not impossible, it's possible, but it depends on the goals, the targets of the company. If the performance is one goal, it's okay to do stacking. Uh, but maybe it's, uh, sometimes companies just want a, a usual uh, model working. Doesn't matter much the performance. And usually a gradient uh, boosting is enough to get that performance, maybe deep learning. So every case is, is different. And the disadvantage, as I told, hard to maintain multiple models. Computational intensive for both train and predict also. Stacking takes a lot of time to predict also. It's not only for train because you have a lot of you can have a lot of models in the in the pipeline. It's very hard to explain the features. Uh, you take a long time to get the final like 0.1% improvement performance. It's very easy to achieve 99% of the performance of the data set, but to improve the, the last mile, the last 0.1%, it can take 10 times more than the time you take to get the 99%. Uh, data change daily, the full pipeline must be computed at the same pace. Very, very easy to overfit. If you build one model, uh, if, if you made some mistakes in one model, or maybe you train using different set of folds, it, you can lead to an um, training set overfit and it can destroy your stacking. That's it. I'm open to questions. Uh, I know it's a lot of formation for 25 minutes, but we can talk later. All right, let's first thank Gilberto for this great talk. Thank you. Let's take one question now and then coffee break and you can take you can ask more questions during the coffee break. Anyone wants to Yeah, sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, so hi Gilberto. Um, I'm really hi. glad of hearing from you about stacking. So the output of stacking are probabilities and Considering to use in a binary classification problems, what technique you believe it's the best to use um, to define the threshold, the boundary? Or, and if there's none, how do you do it? Okay, for binary classification, uh, you probably you have a lot of classificators in the stacking, but to find the final threshold, you need to compute all the predictions out of fold, even for a final predictions, and you can uh, use a an, an simple optimization algorithm to find the threshold. If you want a hard decision, a hard prediction, right? you don't want the soft ones, you, you can use an uh, optimization algorithm directly on the predictions. It's, it's pretty, uh, uh, actually it's pretty simple. There's not many fancy algorithms, it's just a simple optimization is enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're going to end it here for the Q&A session. We're 30 minutes behind schedule, sorry about that, but we'll uh, keep the 30-minute coffee break and then start talks again at 30 past 11. Thank you very much. And thank again, Gilberto. Thank you.